we're back. We're back here on live to take some questions. Let me pull the questions up because you know if Ed does what it. Doing? What you doing? What? They're on your phone, Hammerhead. Somebody reached out to us and said, "I want to specialize in bed bug extermination. Is that possible?" Well, the answer to that is you got to do a lot of things before you can do that. I'm going to assume you're not in the pest control business now. If you're in New York State, you got to take a 30-hour class, uh, approved 30-hour class, and you get a certificate saying you attended the 30 hours. In um, most states, basically, you have to get certified. Yeah. So then, then you go in New York State. You got to sign up to take two tests, two state tests. You pass the two state tests in the beginning. You want to become a general practitioner. That means you can do houses, you can do apartments. Well, he wants to do bed bugs. Let's, he's, bed okay, bugs is, is but here's fall the under seven A. Yes, that well, I'm getting to the whole thing. When you pass those two tests, you're a technician. You're not an applicator. That means you can't buy the drug uh, chemicals to, to treat these things. But if you work for another company for two years, you can get a letter from that company saying you've been a good employee. Send it up to Albany, you can become an applicator. While you're working for the other company, you're working under their certification, their supervision. Yes, you can specialize. I mean, specialize. You need a lot of training. You got to go out with guys that have been doing it for a while and learn from guys out in the field. What I'm assuming, I want to specialize in bed bug extermination. You want to start your own company, you got to become an applicator. That means you work for somebody for two years, they give you a letter. Or you work for them for one year and go take another 12 credits, category specific credits in 7A, and you can do it in a year. Now you want to go into your own business. You have to apply for insurance. Then you got to apply to the state. They got to get their taste of the action. Whatever the business is, you got to register with the state. It's 450. Prior to, you've got to form a business. Now, I don't know whether you want an LLC or whatever. You've got to talk to your accountant or your lawyer, figure out what company, or how you're going to form the company. If you want to do it and you don't want insurance and you don't want the state to know anything, you want to keep all the money. That's illegal. All you need is one mistake. It's illegal. No, you shouldn't do it. It's illegal. We don't condone that. The end. The answer to your I'm question. I'm not condoning it. I'm just telling you, you're going to screw yourself. You kiss your wife, your kids, your chicken, your dog, your ass goodbye. Because once you get caught, you're screwed. In that order. Chicken, wife, daughter, yeah, ass, yeah. dog. That was the super long version of the answer. Can you specialize in bed bugs? The answer is yes, you can. There are pl plenty of people out there that specialize in bed bugs. And being that bed bugs are relatively new and the science on them is still evolving and research is still taking place, it's very easy to become a bed bug specialist. They're not we that simple. You gotta spend some time out in the field. But can you specialize in bed bugs and not do other... Yeah, if you, you wanna limit yes. your income, yeah. If you yes, but you would income. definitely be limiting your income. Mm, that's good booze. All right, let's go. You're fucking drinking coffee. Oh, I got the wrong cup. <laughs> All right, next question. Can I become a pest control specialist if I have a felony on my driver's license? So this is definitely something that is state to state. We don't know all of the state rules. We know New York state rules. So New York state rule is you need to call the DEC up in Auburn and find out. They take this on a case by case basis. So don't even take the course until you talk to somebody up in Auburn. You'd have to submit forms to them. If, you, if it was a felony, I assume you did some time in a joint. So you got to get a letter from your parole officer. You got to get a letter from a minister, people in the neighborhood saying, what a swell guy. So in the state of New York, they have this thing. It's legitimately called a felony Packets. packet. The answer is yes, you can. It's not will I, it's can I. Yes, you can, but you got to fill out a felony packet. Yes, you can do it, but this is what you got to do in order to obtain it. And why would you start if you don't call up there first and tell them what your problem is? You let the DEC tell them. Fill out this thing and send it to us. You need to check with your state. In the state of New York, you can if you have a felony, but there's some hoops you have to jump through and prove why you should be given this state license. In other states, we really can't comment on because we, we don't know. know the law. You ever been You ever been in a courtroom? Ask questions? Yeah. So, you ask a question. I'm not familiar with that. No. Have you ever... I can't recall. What's the next one? Let me see. Where is it? Someone you might know. Uh... Why is it someone I might what a jerk off. You might have had you might have had a relationship with? Yeah. What a jerk. So the 
I am four months pregnant, Ed, and it could be yours. I had a confirmed bed bug sighting. I got the prep sheet, but there's no way I can do all of those steps right now. Will you still treat for bed bugs if I can't bag all my clothes for six weeks? So this is obviously a treatment process that somebody goes over six weeks, very similar to ours. So there's multiple ways to answer this person's question. There's the option of heat, which is now an economic concern for the person. You're four months pregnant, you know, you got the prep sheet, you can't do it. When we do heat treatments, we like to drill in between the wall voids and pump dust into the wall, right? We do that with all of our treatments, but with heat, we also like to do it. Depending on if the person is chemically sensitive, then even though it's a 25B product that we pump in the wall, we probably still won't use it. But to answer this person's question is, yeah, heat would be the first option, but you're probably quadrupling the cost from a chemical treatment. The other option is to hire a prep company if you still wanna go with chemical. And now what we find with some of our customers is prep combined with a chemical treatment is is very close to the cost of a heat treatment. So at that level, it's a real decision that has to take place by the customer. You know, if somebody could save 800 bucks, then they will go with the chemical treatment. And the other end where people are like, I don't even care about the difference in cost. You're telling me that I could have a heat treatment and know whether or not the bed bugs are gone within two days, I'm in. So basically with the heat treatment, the way we do 90% of our bed bug treatments are dog confirms bed bugs in the location, treatment, chemical heat. We don't do freezing unless it's combined with one of the other two chemical or heat treatments. Cause as you've seen on certain websites that it doesn't work as great as it's supposed to. So we do chemical treatment. After the final treatment, two weeks later of a chemical treatment, we send the dog in to confirm yes or no. So if you follow our protocol, you're not gonna have a yay or nay with the dog until a full two months in, cause you treatment today, treatment two weeks from today, and then a treatment a month from there, and then a the dog can't go in for two weeks. It's an eight week process. With heat treatment, heat treatment done today, dog comes in two days later, says yay or nay. And if it says yes, there's no bed bugs, then that's it, that, that apartment is cleared, we're good to go. If it says, oh no, we did have another alert, then our policy and should be your policy is that you go back and heat for free. So to answer the question is yes, there are alternatives and you don't have to prep. We just need to discuss the economics or you need to discuss the economics with your pest management professional. And if they don't have access to heat, tell them to give us a call. So the next one here is, uh, hey guys, I love the podcast, obviously a very intelligent person. I don't like using poisons around the house because I have pets. What is the best mouse trap to get for my house? I like the uh, catchables. They, they're about the size of a shoe box and you wind them up like you're winding a clock. Don't wind them too tight. And there's a hole on each, you know, there's, there's a hole on each side, not that big. And the mouse looks down there and they're curious and they walk down. When they get to the middle, there's a lever there, chips it. There's housings for snap traps. There's plastic housings, and there's also um, cardboard housings. They're called trap rights. You can get hard plastic also. Yeah, but that that's houses where I would it. get the hard plastic. And you put the snap traps in it. We've had a lot of what success. What if you got one of these little foo-foo dogs that weighs like 10 or 12 pounds and jumps on it? You don't think that's going to bust them up a little bit? Bust them up? No. You don't break, you break them in. I've given her all the options for the for the way that she doesn't want to use okay. a rodenticide. Okay. If you have no budget economically and you want to be alerted, you know, you could always go with our good friend Ethan at VM Products with the uh, VM Now stuff where he has the one that automatically texts you when it goes off. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it was, it was down in my forest. Oh, that's right. You were there. You were there for the dinner. To answer that question, the catch-all, the tin cat... The old school snap trap. I mean, glue boards too. Glue boards are definitely not the best tool for mice, certainly not rats, but you can catch them in it. It just, you, you when dealing with rodents, you need to use everything possible against them. And if you're going to take rodenticide out of that mix, you need to be ever more diligent in your trapping program. The thing with the glue boards though, you're liable to catch your cat or your dog on them too. Be advised, you're only going to catch young mice on that because as mice get older their verbisate or whiskers grow longer and then uh, they move around and as they 
they use them to touch the side wall, so they always like to have a wall or something they can touch on. But they their also have feel is that pop out easily. They're like whiskers on a cat. Yeah. And they pop out. Once they hit that glue board, they're going to jump to the side or jump over. Here's another thing with the glue boards, right? If you put it in the rodent's runway, especially mice, when you come home at night and that mouse is scared and just trying to run, they're not going to be able to use the vibrisse as normally as if they were just out hanging out like, yo, what's going on in the kitchen? Oh, shit, there's a glue board. Let me get out the way. When you come home, they're running for their life to get away from you. He's correct where you're really only going to catch the young and the, the weak that. with the scenario I just gave you. When proper placement is done, you may catch an adult. Then, then, then the other... Oh, they're strong. Correct. When dealing with rodents, you need to apply all of the tools in the tool bag. Glue traps, snap traps, mechanical traps, rodenticide. And here's another thing we didn't even talk about. I know what you're going to say. Go ahead. What am I going to say? Sealing up. Exclusion! Yes. You go around, you you know, and it's an add-on service for us, all of us PMPs. So what he's talking about is mice delineate their territory by dribbling urine. They've dribbled urine around. That's why you got to put all the dishes and sweet and long stuff away. Anyway, that's like you and I put our name on our doorbell. So now we knocked out that family of mice. Little Freddie and Ethel are gone. And their kids. We, we got them all. They're not urinating. They're not dribbling urine. Now, Mikey, his family's expanding. He, they're always looking around. They don't, they don't smell any urine. No one lives here. They're going to move in. So, what, 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 wow, wait a minute. So what do we do? We have to find out what brought them there. It's food, water, and shelter. That's what they're looking for. How did they get there? Did they come up through the plumbing? Did they come up through some, some other way? We got to find how they got in to the, to the house, to the apartment, to the kitchen, whatever. And we need to seal those holes up. We're using a lot of uh, uh, copper mesh now. Copper mesh doesn't rust like steel wool would rust. And what happens is, even with the copper mesh, when you seal a hole from the earth rotating and cars going by, there's vibration. And these mice come in, they see this thing, they'll pull on it for six to eight months to lay loosen it up. So it needs to be checked periodically. Tell them other things they can do, but that's, that's no, my so favorite. Cop copper mesh is very good, and it's, it's uh, probably more economic than the other polyethylene-encoded steel wool that's out there. Do we have a favorite mouse trap? Yeah, I like the Ketrel trap. But here's the thing. I think what he's alluding to. When we go in and take your money, we're using a lot of different things. It's like, you know, when you were a kid in East Flatbush in Brooklyn, you got in a fight. You just weren't throwing rights. You were throwing lefts. You grabbed the guy behind the back of the head, and you brought his head into your knee. You used everything you could to get the guy hurt. It's the same thing with the mice. So we may use a lot of different things. But if you 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 want you don't want to trap you want something that's so I gotta go with big red on this snap traps. Well, if, snap if traps. If you're only gonna let me do one, I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna go nuts like nuts. Remember the time that we we used seventy five rat snap traps? Yeah. And we spent a week there. We so just to give you an example, seventy five rat snap traps, and my company has done this numerous times over and over and over again. 75 mouse snap traps. I went one day. We baited them one day with Ed's favorite, General Salami. I went back another day. Maybe we put chocolate syrup on it. Then he went back another day. Maybe we put tuna fish on it. And so on and so forth until every trap pretty much within a six or six or eight day period, every trap had had the food that we put on any given day removed. And then we went back and baited them all again and set them. And out of 75, probably got about 60 kills. But we didn't have to worry about any animals and stuff like that. No, this was, okay. this was on an enclosed site. But I'm just saying, that is why, like, if you would only give me one, I would use a snap trap for numerous reasons. One, it works well. Two, it's reusable. Three, aside from a glue trap, it's probably the cheapest tool that we have to That's use. That's true. One thing you got to remember which you alluded to, is when you use these traps, you don't use two or three. You use as many as you can fit into the place reasonably. And my theory is you got to do it quickly because when they start seeing Louie and Larry are disappearing, sooner or later they're going to associate it with these snap traps. Then you're going to have to wait 90 days for another generation to come around before they're going to really work well again. Use them as many as you 
can reasonably fit in to a certain area if you're going to well, use the Snapchat. You hope you get yeah. the majority. You hope you get the alpha. It's always so pleasing when these plans work. Like, you know, we, we're giving you free food for three or four days, and then we set the snaps and we kill you. It's just... <laughs> ah, nothing better than that. This really makes you... Exterminator's hot. So here's a big thing that's been going on, a big debate in the industry about buying chemical on Amazon. It's a huge debate. It's a method. Dropshipping is what I'm talking about, the method of how Amazon delivers. It's a method that a lot of our distributors would love to go to, but due to certain needs and how we maneuver, I'll give you a perfect example. We just got a huge job that requires 330 rat bait stations with a brick inside them or whatever, right? I don't keep 330 of those in my storage facility. So I gotta order those. And of course, I'm trying to keep my cost as minimal as possible. So if the contract is signed today, I'm ordering it today. Of course, the customer wants the work done today. So I'm telling XYZ company, I need it today. I think eventually they'll be shipping chemicals. I don't know if they'll be able to keep the prices down. I think the logistics of getting licensed in every state and having those licenses from all DEP or the DEC or the Department of Agriculture, I just think for them, they'll never get into the restricted use game, which is mostly what a lot of us PMPs use. So I think it's a resource to look at from a business owner standpoint. Amazon will never have the level of customer service that our local distributors have. You'll never get it. And I think for us in this industry, it may happen down the road, but I don't think it's gonna happen while I'm in business. What do you think? I wouldn't put anything past them. I, I admire Amazon because they told those blowhard politicians in New York to go to hell. They may end up coming back, though. Yeah, they'll get a better deal. Yeah, not that the politicians are begging them to come back. I think that the margins are not high enough for them to That's do possible, all yes. the logistics behind it. And everybody in business understands margins. Pest control is a pretty nice margin. Pest control distribution margins they suck. Now they do. I mean, they used to be great. You know, back in the day when Ed Sheehan was had hair running and gun. Nah, I don't. I mean, I don't. You weren't even in pest control when you had hair, or is that what made you lose your hair? I don't know. I think it was after you were born. No, no, no. Bullshit. There's pictures of you holding Eddie Bald. But no, no. I I could show you a picture. I got them home. Peg, Peg's got the pictures. I right, so um, I want to see them. But my point is because I got pictures where. I'm not bald holding Eddie. That's probably someone else's baby. <laughs> and who knows? Jeff Bezos, if you want some help, holler at us. We, we consult for everybody, big and small, you know? Yeah, we're not politically motivated. Would you consult for Jeff Bezos? Sure. Absolutely, right? So we did. We had some commercial sales questions. We're going to try and get into some more sales stuff in the next... Uh, some sales stuff, some pricing. We have a group of attorneys working on what we're allowed to speak about and what we're not allowed to speak about when it comes to pricing. We have this huge team from New York, White, Cerrito, and Nally. They're working on it, letting us know what we can and can't say because we don't want to. We don't want to. No get more. It. Do we cheat them in hell? No. Oh, okay. But you know, we don't want any racketeering cases. We don't want any collusion cases. Okay. okay. We're just here trying to help the people. Let's wrap it up. You know. This is Ed Sheehan thanking you. Keep those questions coming. We'd love to answer them. Until we meet again, God bless you.